Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are lucky enough for our time to have the man who is taking on the welterweight title, taking on the champion. I look at him and he is the number one contender. There's no doubt. You look at what he's done. Look at all of the wins in a row. The man who deserves a shot at the title, Bilal Muhammad. How are you doing, my man? Uh, feeling great, man. Whenever you're in camp and the camp's coming to an end and you're healthy, <laughs> really fight good. week is finally here. That's that's the prize to get the fight week. You know, um, what? I guess let's jump right into the fact that this thing took forever to put together. I mean, oh. do you, can you give us some insight on what the holdup was? Bro, I wish I knew, right? <laughs> For me, it was like I had so many doubts, so much anxiety yeah. to – because I felt like I've earned it for so long, like yeah. you said. And then even after beating Gilbert Burns, there was still so much delay and there was still so much excuses. And even the fans and mm -hmm. the trolls and the people that are telling you, you still don't deserve it and the yada, yada, yada. But finally, once it was here, finally, once I got the, the contract, that's when I was like, ah, sense of relief. Mm -hmm. But also, it was like, the job's not done. No. Like, I'm not here to say I fought for the belt. I'm here to say that I won the belt and I was the best welterweight to ever do it. So... Uh, Saturday night, it starts with Leon Edwards. Bilal, you have absolutely improved so much throughout your career. It's taken you a ton of time to finally get this title shot. But you started off with just outstanding wrestling, pressure fighter. You would take people down. Your ground and pound was vicious. Now you've gotten to the point you're comfortable in the stand-up. You look comfortable when you're out there. Your fight against Sean Brady was absolutely poetry in motion. It was fantastic. How comfortable are you with all the elements that are now part of mixed martial arts to where you say, I can fight anybody in any, any, you know, as far as the wrestling, I can wrestle with them. With jujitsu, I can be that with them. Or in the stand up, I can stand with anyone. Yeah, honestly, I think that I'm the most complete. Uh, martial artist in the game right now, especially in my division, because you see me just strike guys. My last two fights, I had to shoot one takedown, and I outstruck Gilbert Burns and Sean Brady. And even in the Gilbert Burns fight, it was three weeks notice, and I still threw over 150 significant strikes. And people will say, man, Leon's the best striker in the division, but he threw 60 strikes yeah. against Kobe Covington, who was coming off the couch two years and looked like trash. Yeah. So I think that <laughs> what I've shown my last couple fights uh, is that I'm growing every single fight. I'm getting, I'm involving every single fight. So for Leon Edwards, if he's looking back at us three years ago, uh, you're going to see a way different version of what I am now. You're going to see a way different version of what I am yesterday. Every single day I'm growing and getting better. Tomorrow I'm going to be even better than this. Next week I'm going to be even better than that. Well, let's talk about that fight three years ago, though. Um, were you expecting or anticipating like that they would be like, hey, you know what? The fight ended the way it did. Let's jump right into possibly an automatic rematch, and let's see where that goes. 100%. Especially just being a fighter, right? Because I took that fight on short notice. He needed an opponent. And then he's the one who created the foul. He did the eye poke. So as a man, for a guy to you know end the fight the way he did, he should have been like, bro, all right, you know, I owe it to you. My bad. I should never poke you in the eye because whenever you go in a fight, you, you want to get a result, either a win or a loss. Mm -hmm. To have a no contest, it was like left like a, a bad taste in your mouth. You're like, bro, what? Like, we don't know who's better than the other person. Let's do it. Run it back the right way. Uh, but he didn't give me that. He wanted to play the, oh, uh, the fight would have went this way, yada, yada, yada. And he's basically, now he's the poster boy for what five rounds is he's the poster boy for you fight till the final bell mm -hmm. uh the way he won the belt the way he got the belt after getting dominated by the Wusman and winning in the last 30 mm -hmm. seconds uh so now when you think back to that fight you're like well i, I had 30 more seconds on the clock i would have i would have dominated leon like i could use that excuse right yeah that's true i mean you could always go back to the chael and the anderson fight right i mean and chael won what 14 and 14 and a half minutes of it or something or 13 and a half more, minutes. Yeah, more than that for my fight, right? what are you got... talking about that was a five round fight that, that was, was 20, that was a five round 23 fight. minutes you 23 and a half yeah. minutes and for my fights bro my my debut in the ufc against alan joe band i got dropped three times in the first two rounds mm. and i still came back in the third round and almost won that fight yeah. i've got i've gotten dropped i've lost rounds before and i'm a guy that gets better as the rounds go on i'm the better as the top the clock ticking my energy goes up. My fuel goes up. So for me, I'm uh, made for five rounds. I got two questions for you. The first one has got to be, 
How much does it bother you when people bring up that first Leon Edwards fight? It was a five round fight. It ended in like 20 seconds of the second round uh, based upon the IPO. But you have a lot of people say, oh, Leon was getting the best of Bilal in that. It's like, it was, it was one round. You know, does, does that bother you? You just throw it to the side. Oh, man, it annoys you, right? Just because that's what trolls will do. That's what these fans, they want to get that out of you. They want to get you to respond to them. So they'll say the, the worst things, the dumbest things. But it's when, like, you have experts and guys who are so-called other fighters that will say, oh, well, Leon was doing this. And it's like, bro, being a fighter, being uh, in this sport for so long, you've seen so much change and within, you know, a blink of an eye, within one thing happening. There's, there's so many ways to lose a fight in this game. There's so many ways for the the turning points in this fight game. It's so much. And there's so many ways that I could beat and uh, finish Leon that whenever these guys come out with their excuses and say this could have happened because of that, I don't want to see this fight. It's not worth it. Uh, it's a joke. So it does piss me off. But at the end of the day, none of that matters anymore because now I got my time to show you guys. Now I got my time to show you guys and prove to you guys what I would have did if I did have those extra four rounds. Yeah, I mean, you look at like uh, fighters like John Jones, right? When he lost to Machida in that first round. I mean, he was having a hard time with Machida in that first round. Yeah. Second round was a completely different story. You know what I mean? So like it, the, the fight's just getting started. I'd like to in introduce you to Josh Thompson who never won a first round. Never, never. <laughs> I never did. I didn't have power. I wasn't, I, no one had to fear me for anything. So it was like, I never won a first round, I think in my whole career. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's like when people, when, when, when trolls, if you want to call them trolls, when they come after you, you know, in the comments going, yeah, well, you're getting dominated in the first round. But then you look at, like I said, the John Jones and Machida fight fights are just getting started in the first round. That's like, that's why majority of the time you call them fill out rounds in that first round. Right. Yeah, exactly. And I think there's a lot of fighters that make their reads in the first round, especially for us with that fight, Leon, I think was out for like two years. And for myself, it was coming off of, uh, a fight with Diego Lima, who's a way different fighter than Leon. So we took this fight short notice. We hopped in. We're like, all right, well, let's see what Leon's going to come to the table. Uh, your first main event. A lot mm -hmm. of stuff changes, too, with the media, the things. So we were all over the place. And then my head coach, Lewis Taylor, he caught COVID that week. Mm -hmm. So he, that was the first time without him being in my corner. So there's a lot of stuff that went on behind the scenes. But also, like I said, it's still only one round. So people could say, make their excuses. But there's not even a need for me to make excuses because it was only one round. There's still four more rounds to go. Do you feel like a five-round fight definitely favors you after watching his last couple of performances against other guys in these in these later rounds? Oh, 100%. Bro, he literally threw 60 strikes against Kobe and gassed out mm -hmm. in the fifth round. I'm looking at this guy like, bro, this is your dominant striker. This guy disrespected your family, your father, and you still went out there and only threw 60 strikes mm -hmm. uh, against a guy with, you know, cardio kickboxing striking. It's, it was hilarious that they, they call this guy the sniper, the killer, this, this, and that. Uh, but when I look at his fights, when I look at his matches, I don't really see nothing that I can't walk through. All right, I got to ask you this because we, we, we've been talking, and I, I honestly believe you're fighting the best I've ever seen. And, and you've consistently gotten better from Damian Maya through Wonder Boy. Your Vicente Luque fight was fantastic. And I thought Sean Brady, look, I think Sean Brady is a hell of a fighter. And you made him look bad in that fight. Mm -hmm. And so the Gilbert Burns fight, obviously, Gilbert's a great fighter. But I heard you talking about this fight. And I heard you saying stuff because fighting is both physical and mental. And you said, here's what the first thing happened in the first round. I'm going to do this. I'm going to let him get up. And I'm just going to, <laughs> I'm going to look at his corner and say, hey, man, you, you need to tell him something right here. And you're saying all this stuff. Please tell me you're not doing that. <laughs> I'm 100%. I'm telling you guys, the way that his coach and his team were, were talking, I said I'd rather have his coach be in the press conference because Leon whispers. He doesn't talk. He doesn't like to do a buildup. And he like there's no promotion on his end. So I'd rather having his coach and his team saying, I didn't deserve it. And this guy, you know, maybe we'll fight Gilbert Burns. After I just beat Gilbert Burns, it like pissed me off so much that I'm going to go out there. I'm going to make a joke out of him in front of his people, in front of his country, in front of his family. And I'm going to show them why I'm the best fighter in the world right now, why I'm the best welterweight in the world right now, and why I'm going to walk through Leon Edwards. But what what areas do you feel like you can walk through him? Because if I go through like how his progression has been as well, like he was predominantly just a striker. And then he's, you could, I guess you could arguably say, even though I felt like Colby took down Usman, that Leon was the first person 
to take down in the statistics to get the takedown against uh, Usman in a fight where he got the body lock and the takedown in the first round, uh, I want to say in their second fight. First fight. Sorry, first fight. No, no, it was their second, it was second fight. fight. Sorry, it was second, second fight. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, in, in all of that, that's all, he's gotten better in his wrestling as well. That's another aspect that you'll have to be a little bit more concerned about. Do you, are you concerned at all that he may try to take you down? Because it was almost like he wanted to prove a point against Usman. I hope he comes out trying to take me down. I hope he comes out trying to wrestle because I'm telling you, I'm levels above him everywhere. Even when people tell me that I'm, I, the only way I could beat him is laying and praying, I'm telling you, I could outstrike him. I could knock him out the way that I see this fight going. He's never fought anybody like me. Usman, at the time, was a champion. He doesn't put a pace on like I put a pace on. When people were talking about him against Kobe, the Kobe that they thought, the way that they thought Kobe would beat him was outpacing him and putting a pressure on him that he's never seen before. Kobe didn't do that. Kobe couldn't do that. That's what I'm going to do to him. He's not. He's never been into the deep part of the pool that I'm going to take him to. He's not going to be able to breathe the way the pace that I'm going to put on. It's going to be kind of like where you look at it and it's you think of a guy like Marab and you think of how Marab fights his fights and people hate to fight a guy like that because he's the hardest type of style because you don't know what he's going to bring to the table. I got better striking than Marab, but I got the same cardio and the same wrestling as him. And that's the type of pressure I'm going to put on him where he's not going to know what I'm going to do. He's going to think that I'm going to wrestle, I'm going to strike. He's going to think I'm going to strike, then I'm going to wrestle. And then I'm just going to let him up just because I want him to let him up and break him. <laughs> I loved how you told, like John was talking about, you said, I'm going to talk to his corner and tell him, give him some motivational words, give him so he can work yeah. through this. I'm going to talk can... to his brother. Yeah. I'm going to tell his brother, you need to help him or something. <laughs> Bro, like you see, right? When you see that his corner advice in me two rounds, it's motivational stuff. It's speeches. There's yeah. not like, there's not technical advice. There, he's a guy that you could tell that he needs that motivation. He needs you to hype him up. He needs you to be like, man, the beautiful striking. This is looking beautiful, right? There's not like, hey, hit him with the one-two here, move left, move right. Uh, because he needs that speech. He needs that Rocky story. That's why, because he can't find that inside of him. And to be a real champion... You don't. You shouldn't need a guy to, to hype you up. You should be able to hype yourself up. What have you seen that has changed out of him? What I've seen, one of the number one things is his takedown defense and his ability to get back up, the double hand wrist control, yeah. his ability to get back up from the bottom. It seems like right now it's the best in the game in terms of his ability to, to get back to his feet after being taken down or stuffing guys' takedowns. I mean, how much have you worked on changing that up, you know, and trying to, to nullify his, his ability to two-on-one? Uh, I mean, I think that for myself and my team, we're the best at finding weaknesses in our opponents and exploiting them and taking them where we're strongest and they're weakest. When you're looking at guys that he's fought recently, like you really can't take much from the Kobe fight because Kobe mm -hmm. looked trash. Mm -hmm. And I don't think Kobe was good at all. And he didn't really try to shoot or push him to any type of pace at all. But he, he had less than like 10 takedown attempts in that fight. And then in the fifth round, he still held him down the whole round. Yeah. In the Usman second fight, I think, I mean, in the Usman third fight, I think Usman was a different version of himself. He didn't have the same confidence, the same swagger that he did as a champion. In the second fight, Usman held him down and dominated him, right? So I think for him, he has a, people have a false sense of uh, security about Leon's wrestling and this, but the guys that he fought and the ways that he fought them, they were different versions of himself. They were worse versions of himself that he fought. Like, they're giving him the, oh, man, he beat Kobe and Usman, who Dana said were the best to ever do it. Uh, but Kobe was a, a shell of himself, and Usman didn't have the same confidence he had after getting knocked out with that head kick. Yeah, because it doesn't take long for top-tier fighters, you know, to be the champion or be fighting at championship level. After one or after one loss, they end up not being the same fighter for a while if they can come back and regenerate themselves, rejuvenate themselves great. But sometimes when guys have been at the top for so long, they sometimes just fall off. They're not the same fighter anymore. The confidence isn't there. And not that Usman uh, is not a stud. I think he's an absolute stud. I'm just simply saying, like, after his loss to, to Leon, he definitely wasn't the same fighter in the second fight. And you've seen that with Colby, too. He had those, those losses to Usman. He, well, he hasn't been the same fighter since losing to Usman those times. Yeah, I think Usman in general, I think he just rushed back after that knockout. Hmm. And to... I've gone against guys that knocked me out before against Luca, and it's a different mental battle that you have to go through to fight a guy that knocked you out before. And I think that you've seen it in his fight where he hesitated a lot until it got to the later rounds when he got more comfortable. And then the comes that fight, he looked more comfortable yeah. just because it was short notice. But I think just Kobe in general, Kobe sucks. And I, I don't think Kobe deserved to be at the top 
at all. And even in those Usman fights, they're just styles make fights, right? That's why they just Usman allowed him to be in those wars uh, with him. But like, I don't think Kobe was good at all, and he didn't deserve the praise that he got, but because he never really fought anybody that great. So for Leon to get a win over him doesn't really mean much to me. Why does Kobe keep getting these runbacks? Can you can you give me some explanation on that? What, what, <laughs> I wish I, I wish I knew, right? I, I don't know. I mean, he got Trump on speed dial. Trump's his manager or something. <laughs> He's got the Trump train, right? The speed dial to the Trump train. He's got the speed dial to Trump. That's, that might be it. Look at this fight. The one thing that I do want to know about how you're looking at it, how you're preparing for it. Because like you said, first off, you know, when you first have those main event fights, those five round fights, it's a different experience. It's different when you're the main event. You got more media. You got all these things. When it's a championship fight, that's why you're on here with us right now. I mean, you're doing all this media and everything is coming at you. And this fight is in Manchester, England, in his backyard. How are you looking at going to England? You know that the fans are going to be against you. But what do you do to prepare yourself so that doesn't even become part of the equation? Uh, honestly, I think that me going to a lot of these events recently, right, Uh I've been going to a lot of pay-per-views, getting in there, and the camera will go on me, and I'll get booed. So I was like, all right, cool. This is, this is a nice warm-up for what's going to happen in England. So I, I'm fine with it. And I'm hoping that since it, be, it being at 5 a.m. that we're going to be fighting at, these guys are going to be t so tired that they're not even going to boo. And the way that I put it, too, also is like, I don't think there's a lot of Leon fans, right? There, there's a lot of fans that want a U.K. champion. But then I'll just like i like, bro, you guys got Aspinall, man. You guys are good with him, man. You guys don't need you guys don't need two. You're you're good. Just let me have this one. <laughs> I like that. I mean, you when you look at other fighters like uh, you had, I I know you had mentioned MVP just recently in one of your interviews, saying that he's one of those guys if he's able to stick around. I mean, how do fighters like that? What do you see out of fighters like him? Guys like MVP. Yeah. I think style styles, right? He brings a, a funky style that a lot of these guys aren't used to. It's a different style that you have to adjust to. And even when you see when they booked the Ian Gary and him fight, I, like I knew it was going to be that type of fight because mm -hmm. Ian's not a dumb fighter. You can't go out there and fight his game when you're fighting MVP because he'll make you look really bad no matter how good you are. Yeah. Even when I fought Wonder Boy, people were like, "Oh man, you're a bum. You only you only wrestled them." Like, yeah, I'm not gonna strike with Wonder Boy. I'm gonna I'm gonna fight him, and I'm gonna take him down. Yeah, I'm gonna take him to where he's not good at. You're a and, bum for having a brain. <laughs> yeah, right. So I think that people are gonna realize that you know, in football, if if I'm a, a running team and I'm going against a, a, a running defense, well, I got a pass ball now. If I'm going against a pass defense, you have to make your adjustments strategy wise, and I, that's the type of IQ that I bring to this game. And I think that. Now you're starting to see with a lot of these younger fighters. Now they're they're starting to think about it in that type of aspect instead of let's just go out there see red and see what happens. <laughs> when you when you are looking at Leon as a, as a fighter though, he is very he's got good speed. He's got very long range and he uses his distance control very well. What have you been doing in your training to make sure that you are not that person that's sitting in front of him, um, being on the center line so you, he can have his shots and then get out of the way of yours? What is it that you're doing to get yourself prepared for his stand-up and then you throwing your hands to possibly either stay on your feet or take the fight to the ground? I, honestly, I think I got one of the best teams in the world, right? Uh, the, one of my main training partners, Ignacio Bahamundes. He's, I think, the best he's striker fantastic. in the UFC. People don't know how good he is. And he's another one of those guys where he brings out what's in the practice room to the cage. You're going to be – it's something special. And he's a lot longer. He's basically the same size as Leon. And his striking is very similar to his. And he's very good at adjusting his style to whoever I, uh, I'm fighting. So we've been doing a lot of scenario stuff. And also – with the last couple of weeks at Islam's camp, I was down there in Jersey with them and just being able to, to get that energy, that champ camp energy and to get advice from Habib, get advice from him. Uh, there's levels to things and to be able to train with those guys and just get any type of knowledge from them and get their feel and get their grappling and get their wrestling. It's people make it fun of me for it and they, they can say I'm on their nuts or whatever, but bro, it's different. Josh, you train with them. Yeah. You've seen how it is. And People don't realize how good they are until you're actually in the room for them. And it's priceless anytime I get a chance to do anything with them. Yeah. It's, what I've tried to explain to people is that 
they're not just like helping you, making you better. Is that you guys are feeding knowledge off of each other and you're bouncing things off of each other. They're sponges. They're constantly asking questions. When Umar first came into the gym, he was 19 years old. And it just like, he's gotten so much better, but he wouldn't leave me alone. Broken English and all and asking his interpreter to, you know, like ask him this, how does he do this to me? How do I, they, they just want the knowledge. And I think what happens with a lot of, I think just fighters in general is our ego gets in the way. We're afraid to ask somebody else. They're not afraid to ask anybody like, Hey, you did this to me. You worked with me on this. Like this was working for you. I was having a hard time defending it. They are sponges, man. They just want to soak up all the knowledge they can. They're also very interested in sharing their knowledge too on what works for them if you ask. Yeah, 100%. And like you said, I had no ego at all. So when I get in there and I go with Habib, he literally ragdolls me and beats me up. And I'm like, the next day I'm like, let's do it again. And uh, Javier Mendez tells me all the time, bro, if you make him work 1% more the next day, that means you're getting better. Yeah. You're growing from it. And I'm not the type to be like, Oh man, I'm at the top of the game. I don't like. I don't like to. Give, I shouldn't be getting beat up right now or this. Like I want to get beat up. I want to know that I'm in a room where, like, I could learn from all these guys. And there's not a weak guy in their room and their, no. uh, on their team, right? Every single round is a hard round. There's not an off round. So I think, anytime I get to go with them and go with their team, it levels me up so much and it makes me go much harder myself in my gym because I know, I'm always in catch up mode. I started MMA late. I started fighting late. So. Every day I'm in the practice room, it makes me want to get better because I know I'm behind all these guys who started since they were two years old, three years old. But it's easy to take your licks from Habib, from Islam, from Abu Bakr, from uh, no, um, other guys that they, we, we've seen them fight or we know who they are. They're world champions. But it's the one that you don't know in the room who's just smashing you too. And you're like, who are you? Where Where do you fight? They're like, oh, no, I don't have any fights yet. What do you mean you don't have any fights? <laughs> And this, Bro, this dude's exactly, foot right? sweeping you. He's hip tossing you. He's arm barring. You're like, what the? Where? What? There's a whole room of them. There's a whole room of them. You know? It's crazy. And then you're fighting for the world title. Yeah. And they're looking at you like, oh, brother, you're fighting for world title? I'm like, nah, man. I'm having an off day. I didn't eat carbs today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, man. I don't know how many times Habib would bring somebody, him and Islam or Abu Bakr or whatever. They'd bring somebody from, from their hometown, from Dagestan, and just be like, all right, who's this kid? This kid just throwing me around and this. I'm like, man, this is not fun. How many fights you got? Oh, I got two fights, brother. I got two fights. <laughs> <laughs> what? It's so humbling. It's very humbling. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, how many times have you have you gone through that at all? Or is it just me? <laughs> oh, bro, I've gone through that so much. Okay. Like even when I was with them for those six weeks for the Sean Brady camp in Dubai, that was like the hardest one, right? Because yeah. every single one of them is a grappler. And I'm thinking I'm going to get Sean Brady who's a grappler. And I'm like, getting beat up by these guys that I had no idea who they were. People don't know who they were. And I was like, man, if these guys are killing me, what's Sean going to do to yeah. me? And then it was like, I get to that level. After every practice, I beep, get in the cage with me. Get in the cage with me. I'm like, bro, we just did sparred and we grappled and we wrestled. Now you want me to get in the cage with you? And he's just like ordering Starbucks as he's on top of me with yeah. a Kimura. And I'm just like, man, I must really suck. Yeah, I'm but set. he is an outstanding person for you to learn how to talk to your opponent or their corner during the <laughs> fight. <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> i've also i've also learned over the years though is that like when he's not in camp and he's not fighting he's a great coach because he has no mercy he's like a dc when dc's in camp oh no no today we're just doing five rounds but when dc's not in camp and running wrestling no no 12 rounds today 12 rounds okay we're we're doing 12 then you're gonna sprawl then we're gonna do some cardio at the end you're like Bro, but when he, when they're in camp, it's a different story. Trust me, it's totally different. Story. But it's so funny because Islam will be like, we'll be doing like push-ups at the end of practice. We're dead, and uh, Islam will be like, this guy crazy, man. This guy crazy. And I'm like, bro, is this what he does? Yeah. He's like, bro, yeah, he's nuts. Yeah. But how yeah. much confidence do you gain knowing that at the age of 36, you have consistently gotten better, and you've gotten better because of putting yourself in those positions in the gyms with those type of people that sometimes they're better than you at something and working your way through those problems, that gives you a ton of confidence that you can handle anybody. Yeah, 100%. I think that that's why a lot of people talk about the age and they have that, you know, oh man, at 36, they know they lose all the title fights or whatever against younger guys. But my 36 is different than a lot of these guys 36. I'm working every single day in the gym. I'm getting better and growing every single day, and I have a different mindset. And also, just being Muslim, there's not, I'm not going out partying. I'm not going out drinking. I don't have no odd times of going clubbing. 
my off times is the gym. Like when the countdown comes, they're like, do you have any hobbies? I was like, no, I don't have hobbies. My hobby is going to the gym and working out. So if you guys want to follow me around, we can follow around. But I'm going from this gym to that gym to that gym. Yeah, I've noticed though when I'm when I was on the road for Bellator, I'd see you know we'd all be going down to get drinks afterwards at the bar, and you'd see Umar and Usman and the other guys headed up to the gym with Ali, you know, at, at eleven o'clock at night. Like, hey, what are you guys doing? Oh, we're gonna go hit the bike in, do a little bit of shadow boxing, break a sweat. And I said, that's where the difference lies. Is that majority is. of fighters are not they're out partying, they're out at the club until two three in the morning. You guys are not doing that, and the growth that that extra sleep, that extra rest time for your body to heal, and then waking up and not feeling a little bit hungover because you were out late at night. Those things go a long way in a twenty year career, fifteen year career, or however long it is. You know, it they, they just go, it goes a long way in helping your growth on a daily basis. You're getting better, and there's nothing in the middle that's just distracting you from that. Yeah, hundred percent. I've seen guys in the gym who are killers, guys that were so close to getting to the UFC, or guys who had so much talent, and then I've seen them just throw it away and get worse and worse and start gradually degrading, just because of their lifestyle instead of you know being confident, and being uh, consistent with uh, training. I've asked every everyone that's anyone that's ever come on our show that's Muslim. I've asked them the same question. I want to ask you: How do you feel coming off of Ramadan? How is it a mental? breakthrough is it a mental breakthrough for you does your body feel physically a lot better going into your camp right after ramadan like do you notice a uh, he's fought a, during ramadan but I, <laughs> i'm simply saying like do you notice a difference though in terms of how your body and your mental and your and your brain works as you're as you're competing oh 100 it's like that's like the best best month of the year for all a lot of us because there's so much clarity in it it's just a spiritual cleansing for you and like you said, I've had camps during it where people are like, you're crazy or this, but I feel a lot stronger during it because of it. Because, you know, that's when you're closest to God, closest to your religion. And that's when you owe everything to God and your religion. So there's not a lot of other stresses that you're allowing to distract you. A lot of other things, the, the, all the negative things in your life that you're doing at that time, you're trying to cut that out during that month. You're trying to get, be a better person and to be a better Muslim that's becoming a better person in general. And I think that's where you see a lot of guys growing as human beings. And once you grow as a human being, I'm just going to grow as an athlete uh, just by luck. I'm, I'm looking so, here. Go ahead, John. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm looking at the rankings here. And I saw the interview that you did where you were talking about certain fighters, you know, Shavkat probably being next. If you were to win the title, I know that Kamaru Usman somewhere in there. I'm not sure if that's even a fight that's on we're the table. Ask the same question. Getting close. Getting close. Go ahead. And then you've got, you know, you've got uh, uh, JDM, which is Jack Della Maddalena. You know, I'm not sure how you feel about fighting Colby because he seems to always find his way back up there. And I mean, I would love to see someone else shun him on. And be like, no, nah, no, nah, you can wait your turn now. Um, you know, but you've got Jack Della Maddalena and you've got Ian Gary. Those are the three guys that pretty much you wouldn't have not fought. Or that are in that top echelon of fighters. I mean, Shavkat obviously would be next. I would assume somewhere in there, unless coming off, of, unless he loses somewhere. But out of those three, which one motivates you the most? Uh, I think the the Shavkat fight would probably motivate me the most because I think I'm a, a guy that people always doubt me no matter what. They're always coming up with excuses why I win. Before the fight, I was 100% going to lose. Then I win, and then they're like, "You won because of this." So even after me beating Leon Edwards. The next tweet that's going to come out is Shavka will kill him, though. 100%. Mm. That'll, be, that'll be the next tweet right away. Uh, so for me, like at the end of the day, I want to be had the best resume at welterweight to ever do it. And I think ready right now, my resume is up there with the Usmans and the Kobe's. If you look at the guys that I've actually fought and the people that the names that I have on my resume, people will be surprised and they look back at it. But me having adding another undefeated guy on my resume like a shop guy after beating Leon Edwards who beat Usman uh, and having Sean Brady and Shavka back to back that would be huge for my resume and then like you said I think it'll eventually end up being like an Ian Gary versus JDM elim eliminator uh, I know they were talking about JDM versus Shavka but I think that JDM got hurt so I think yeah. Shavka is probably like a clear next in line contender uh, and it makes the most sense Usman is there at the top and I know you guys are both managed by Ali. I mean, is how does that conversation go? Has there even been a conversation like if we have to fight, we have to fight, or is it just business is business? Oh uh, man, yeah, he's not my teammate, so I don't no, care about okay. him at all. Like I've been wanted, I've been calling for Usman when he was champion. Okay, so I've been asking for those fights, those big name fights, and he's obviously one of the biggest names in the division. 
I just think right now it would be hard for him to get the next shot because yeah. he's on a three-fight losing streak. And especially if I walk through Leon, who basically beat him twice, mm-hmm. it would really be, people would be like, oh, it doesn't really make any, any sense. Yeah. Money-wise, it would probably make sense. But like I said, for me to be a, a, a champion, I want to be the guy that beats the best guy that's next. Mm-hmm. And I think that Shotgun would probably be the best guy next in line. Coming off of beating Leon Edwards, we say you beat Leon. You are the champion. You will say you take on Shavkat. We'll say you win that. How much longer are you going to go? How much are you 100% in to MMA right now that you say, I'm going to stick around this long? John talking retirement right now, man. No, We're no, talking no, no, titles, no, no, and he's retirement. talking retirement. What is going Dude, I've on? Already, I, look, I already gave him two wins. <laughs> 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 It, the, that's the hard part, right? Because you don't start making money until you're the champion. You don't yeah. start making money until you're this deep into your career. But for myself, it's all about body-wise, listening to your body health. Like, this is the best I've ever felt. This is the best, best I've ever looked. And I think now I understand the game so much more than I did when I was younger. I understand training differently than I did when I was younger. And all these little adjustments... I think I, I just keep becoming the best best version of myself. So if I could go into the Glover Teixeira age, the Randy Couture age, I would do it, man. But uh, it's just listening to your body, you know, knock on wood. Hopefully we stay healthy and uh, stay hungry. Bet US, America's favorite sports book and casino. Live betting and race book. We're celebrating 30 years with a historic offer. A 125% sign up bonus on your first three deposits. Plus 10% gambler's insurance. Get started today. Bet US, where the game begins. So we work with a company called Bet US, and they put out the odds today on you, and they said basically you're a plus 170, Leon Edwards a minus two, uh, 210. What, I mean, what what are your thoughts on those odds? I mean, are they kind of what you thought, or you thought they'd be lower, higher? What did you? What are your thoughts? I mean, I've been an underdog for my last five fights. It, it, they always doubt me. They're always saying this. Like I said, him coming off of two big wins against Usman and then uh, the win against Kobe, it's understandable, right? But I figured that they would probably want make me even a bigger underdog. Uh, I'm actually surprised, but for myself, stylistically, and for the way that I think I'm going to fight him. Uh, I see myself as a freaking 10 to 1 favorite. I look at when they do the odds like this. You guys have already shared the cage for one round. I know it's one round, but the filling out process is already over. Do you feel like you can just kind of pick up, like you've already kind of seen the speed? You kind of, you kind of, you know, you've kind of can judge the speed a little bit, how he moves. Does that kind of give you a little bit of ease knowing that you've already been in there with him for, for a little bit? And you can kind of feel the footwork, the speed, the range, the quickness, how he kind of moves his body. Does that take some pressure off you a little bit? I mean, I think actually having like a full camp takes the pressure off. Mm. For myself, having a full camp, we're so diligent with everything that we do. And I get so much confidence of knowing that I left no stone unturned with this. And especially with this camp right here, it's one of my best camps, strongest camps. So that's what gives me the confidence. That fight three years ago, I know that I made so much improvements and adjustments and yeah. uh, grown so much as a fighter and uh, body-wise and, you know, system wise that I'm sure that he has too. So I don't want to take anything like, Oh man, he's going to be the exact same way. And especially it was a smaller cage back then as well. This one's a bigger case. This one's a big one. Uh, so the biggest thing I could take from it is just knowing that I have a full camp now. Do you like the smaller cage or do you prefer the bigger cage? Because there is a big difference, you know, in the size. Oh yeah. No, it's a way it's a huge difference. Actually, I like the bigger cage in general more. Uh, why is that for myself? I, I feel like the smaller cage, I'm, I like to move laterally a lot too. I, I like to fight forward, backwards, uh, left, right. I, I like to move a lot, and I think it just gives me more space. And then just the apex is just like so closed off. Yeah. It's like you hear their corner, and then I hear their freaking guy talking trash, <laughs> breathing in the front row. Like when it's the bigger uh cage i know it's a bigger arena and all you just hear is the cheers or the booze uh so you but you don't hear the little stuff do you feel like it's been a mistake that the ufc's been in the apex for so long i know the covid situation was a was a lifesaver for a lot of fighters and to make money but i feel like you know not coming out of there not being able to to gain new fans also too some of the performances i think by the fighters have been a little bit more lackluster because there is no one pumping you up there is no one you know uh cheering you on i mean it's a small group and like you said, maybe the corners have to pump you up. You know, the other the other team's corners are pumping you up by talking trash. 
But do you do you feel like uh, you know fighting in there is just it's just not the same? And do you feel like it affects your performances at all? Oh man, yeah, it's definitely not the same. Just it's a different type of energy, right? I think I fought there like three or four times, yeah. and it just uh, it feels like more like sparring match because it is so quiet and you don't get that same feel as when you're walking out and you see all the fans in the crowd and the they're cheering for everything mm -hmm. no matter what, and that's what gets you going because. When I first started this, it's like you you feel like kind of like I always always used to be like a WWF wrestling fan, and when you go to the WWF events or the WWE events, it's crazy how much energy is yeah. in there, and then you feed off that energy. So when the crowds in in the arena and they're all going nuts, that's a different type of energy. It's the best energy. Yeah, there, there's I always say that's a drug that you can't buy because it's the only only place you can get it is when you are the guy walking out there and you have that buzz going. But you, I'm going to have to ask you, what is your prediction? How are you going to finish this fight? And what round are you going to do it in? Uh, I think I finish him in round three. Round I think three. Uh, it's going to be a knockout. And people will say, and even if you guys clip that off, people are going to hate on it. But well, I'll like tell it. you right now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit him, and I'm going to break him, and he's going to fold. All right, so I've got two questions, but this one here is going to be a little more lighthearted, though, is you've got the Jake Paul and Mike Perry coming up. Mike Perry coming from the MMA world, fighting Jake Paul. What are your thoughts on this celebrity slash MMA boxing crossover YouTube uh, stuff? What are your thoughts on it, and how do you see that fight going? Do you even care? That's, that's another question. <laughs> don't don't, I mean, I like don't hurt Perry, me here, honestly, Bilal. I don't hurt me, okay? <laughs> Don't break my heart. <laughs> <laughs> I care just because it's Mike Perry, right? He's an MMA guy, and yeah. he's one of the guys that, like, when you think about the other guys that Jake Paul fought, like, they're all older in their career or really didn't really care about it, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, you can tell Mike Perry's hungry. Mike Perry's still in there. He's still got that dog in him, and I think that he's going to put on a good show for the MMA fighters, and he's a guy that I would let go to battle for the MMA name, right? So I think that's going to be a fun fight, and people are looking at Jake Paul. He's definitely... Uh, huge right now. And he's going to be a lot bigger than Perry, but I think that he hasn't fought anybody like Perry who has that power. And like I said, just has that natural dog in him. Got it. Got yeah. it. I, I, you know what told me he was going to win the fight? Eddie Hearn. You know who Eddie Hearn is from, from <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mushroom Boxing, right? He, he got on a thing and said, there is no way Mike Perry could ever beat Jake Paul in a boxing match. I said, oh my God, Mike Perry's going to win. Right there. <laughs> really? It just told me. <laughs> He said that? <laughs> he said that. Uh, I'm like, uh, you have no clue. So, look, my, my final question will have nothing to do with fighting, but I, I just wanted to – you've been very public about what's going on over in Gaza, and I wanted to get your take on um, the presidential race here in the States and just the political climate. And what what are your thoughts? That's all. And just be as frank as you want or as, as, oh. low, as slow as you – however you want to talk about it. I mean, honestly, it's – the presidential race in America is kind of like a, a joke. Mm -hmm. You see both these guys, and even in the, their, their debates, the way they're talking, it's like we have two 80-year-old guys, one that's forgetting everything he's saying, and then one that's basically lying about everything he's saying. And it, it's hard, especially with the time that's going on right now in Gaza because it's, it's a distraction mm -hmm. for a lot of the people in America with the, you know, People are dying there. People are losing their lives. People are waking up every day not knowing where their next meal is going to come from, not knowing whether water is going to come from. They're, they're starving here. And like I said, we had this kid, uh, Jude, from Gaza, and he's just a normal kid. He literally had screws coming out of his knees when he came to America and came to Chicago to get real surgery done on himself mm -hmm. because he was when he was in Gaza, his mom saved his life because they got bombed and she was laying on top of him. And his knee got like dislocated and he had to do surgery there with no anesthesia and they had to put screws in his knees. And his kid's two years old and it's crazy. But now he's sitting here in the pool eating, you know, French toast in the morning, eating fruit and vegetables and just like loving life. He's living what a, a, a life a kid's supposed to have. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's hundreds of thousands of kids out there in Gaza that don't have this luxury. They don't have this chance at, at a real life. And neither one of these presidents care. Neither one of these presidents is going to go up there and, and, and make a stop to this. It's the world, it's the public that's going to keep posting about it, talking about it, speaking about it, that's going to make this change. And I think in general, the world's eyes are really starting to open now, and I'm hoping that there's some real changes that come from it. I agree.
Well, I agree with you. I hope there is big changes that comes with it because all the fighting needs to stop. And people need, as, as simple as it gets, young kids yes, should sir. never be dying in wars. No. Should not they happen. should be worried about, you know, eating fruits and vegetables. Oh, I don't oh, want to eat the vegetable. Not nah, like, is, is my mom going to be a, uh, alive in the morning? Am I going to be alive in the morning? Like, they should yeah. have dreams and aspirations of being firefighters or, or policemen, not like I hope to see the age of 12. Or superheroes yeah. like Bilal Muhammad, right? <laughs> My brother, yeah. <laughs> That's it, baby. Hey, uh, I just want to tell you, thank you so much for your time. Congratulations on finally getting a fight you deserved for a long time. And the best of luck when you go over to Manchester. Do your thing and have fun doing it. Best of luck, brother. Thank you, guys, man. Pre wait, wait. Who's this guy, man, brother? Who is this guy? <laughs> Who is this man? Who is this guy? Brother? He said nothing. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> All right, brother. Appreciate Thanks, man.